Hello and welcome to Inside Healthcare. We have a great program for you and we begin by talking with a local doctor about allergies and allergic reactions. And we're very pleased to have back with us Dr. Rob Anderson from the Urgency Room. So thank you for being with us. Thank you. Pleasure to be back. Um, so first of all, I mean, what are allergies? I think most people are familiar with allergies. It's going to be um, typically seasonal allergies is what people are most familiar with. And we're coming in that springtime Yeah, here. springtime. All the pollens, the flowers that are out there, the grasses that are coming out. A lot of people can tell you before they even start to come out, they start to feel that they get those kind of watery, itchy eyes, a runny nose, a congestion, and just feeling kind of under the weather. And they, um, I always ask that question, I mean, how can you tell if it's not a cold that you're getting versus the allergies and stuff? That's a really good question. You know, one thing you can try is just taking an over-the-counter antihistamine. And quite frankly, if you feel better from that and you don't have a fever, then typically it is more seasonal allergies. A lot of people are quite familiar too. They know every spring I'm going to get this. So, um, but if it's, you know, coming up a little bit more atypically or if you're developing a fever with it, then it certainly could be an upper respiratory infection oh, okay. or sometimes even a bacterial sinus inf uh, infection is possible too. And um, you were saying that um, the seasonal, what other type of allergies do you see? Well, at, certainly at the seasonal room? allergies to like pollens and grasses, but then you can also have allergic reactions as well. You know, bees are going to be out and singing people, and those can cause allergic reactions. And then people also have allergies to different foods, um, different things in the environment as well. And you may not know that you have allergies, right? I mean, mm -hmm. all of a sudden you may have a reaction, and yep. it could be very serious. It certainly can be, and, you know, that's the, the two extremes are, you know, um, seasonal allergies, a little bit of runny nose, nothing to worry about. And then the other extreme is going to be anaphylaxis, and that's where your entire body just kind of shuts down and has a, a significant immune response to some type of allergen. And that's going to be more typically of your bee sting. And, and what you alluded to is, is correct that, Sometimes you may not know. You actually have to be stung by a bee twice before you know if you're truly allergic to it. No way. Yeah. Oh, wow. So what happens is your body is going to be stung by a bee the first time, and then you get a little local sting, a little redness and warmth, mm -hmm. and it's sore, and it goes away. You put some ice on it, some Benadryl, and it gets better. But it's not until your sec second time that you're stung by the bee that you know if you truly have an anaphylactic allergic reaction to the bee or not. And you may have, what, what would be some of those symptoms that you are That's having? Good question. Yeah, so reaction. signs of that would be, um, you know, difficulty breathing, wheezing, feeling kind of lightheaded like you might pass out. Sometimes people develop GI symptoms as well, even like vomiting or really? diarrhea. Really? GI yep. symptoms? It affects the entire I wouldn't have um, even body. made that connection. Yep, yep. It certainly can affect the GI tract. Um, hives is also very common, and that's one of the more common things that we see people at the urgency room for. They come in just head to toe hives, and they're oh, just wow. itching. It's just, it's incredibly uncomfortable. Um, and there's a spectrum of treatment that we can provide for people uh, to help minimize those symptoms and help them um, kind of power through that uh, histamine response to their so body. So what would be some of those type of treatments that you might offer them? Yeah, so there's a lot of over-the-counter medications like diphenhydramine as a first-generation antihistamine. You have your second generation antihistamines like loratadine, um, et cetera. And so those medications may help a little bit, but typically if you're just head to toe hives, that's when we start to think about steroids as well. Um, sometimes oh. we have to do epinephrine Steroids, auto injectors. Okay. People are familiar with the EpiPen or it's an epinephrine auto injector. Sometimes people have to give themselves a shot of that if their hives or their allergic reaction is severe. And we always recommend that if somebody has one of those devices and they inject it into their thigh, that they don't see how they feel after a little bit, but they inject it into their thigh and either call 911 or come to the emergency department or to the urgency room. Because what can happen is you'll feel better for about 20 minutes, but all of a sudden your symptoms can come back and sometimes even be worse. So you need to be in a medical oh, facility yeah. where you can just be watched for a while. And it can potentially be deadly as well. It right? certainly can be. Um, so you it's don't very want scary. to take them lightly in that. Yep. And then, um, you did mention some over-the-counter medications, mm -hmm. others that might be recommended if someone's having some allergies? And yeah, just a simple allergies, over-the-counter um, oral medications. I mean, the brand names would be like Claritin, Zyrtec, et cetera. Um, there's also some nasal sprays that you can use as well that can be helpful. Mm -hmm. um, and some of these medications can even be used in pregnancy as well. And actually, even for kids, sometimes they do require these over-the-counter um, antihistamines. It can be helpful too. But any questions about symptoms and things like mm -hmm. that, they should contact you guys? And yeah, we're happy to see people. You know, um, commonly we'll see people come in, you know, wondering if it's a cold, if it's allergies. We'll see people come in, you know, if they go to a local retail clinic and a, a discount shopping store or a grocery store, 
and the nurse practitioner or PA there gets worried and then they send them to us where we have the ability to do the um, epinephrine auto injectors or subcutaneous medicines. We have the ability to put that adrenaline or epinephrine directly into the IV to put people on life support, you know, even if it comes to that. And hopefully it never mm -hmm. does, but that's typically when people will come into us when they think their symptoms are becoming severe. Well, great information, yeah. and you're located in three places in the yep. Twin Cities. Yeah, we're in Egan, Woodbury, and Badness Heights. We're open every single day of the year, including holidays and weekends. Dr. Anderson, so. always great to have you with us. Thank you, Joe. Great advice. Still ahead, uh, we'll take you inside a brand new food shops that's just opened up in the community, so stay with us. Chris Domine is a husband, father, and athlete because a kidney transplant gave him a second chance at life, made possible by an organ donor. Imagine what you could make possible. Learn more and sign up as a donor. Go to organdonor.gov. Welcome back to Inside Healthcare. The Christian Cupboard Emergency Food Shelf has been around for more than 30 years, serving people from the communities of Woodbury, Oakdale, Landfall, and parts of Maplewood. And until recently, the food shelf was housed in the basement of a Woodbury church. Thanks to a two-year fundraising campaign, the Christian Cupboard just built and opened its brand new facility in Oakdale. So we're pleased to have with us the Executive Director, Greg Metzger. So thank you for being with us. Thank you for the opportunity. So for people not familiar with this, tell us a little bit about the food shelf. Well, as you mentioned, the areas that we serve, um, it's a critical resource for families that are struggling to make ends meet. Uh, we provide a variety of shelf stable as well as fresh fruits and vegetables, dairy, proteins, and the like when people come and visit us um, once a month. And you've been around almost 35 years this, later this yes, year. Yes, in fact, it'll be the 35th anniversary in September. So why open a brand new separate facility at this time? Well, um, the need unfortunately continues to grow. It's a function of growing populations, but also more and more families that are challenged by um, getting healthy, nutritious food on the table. And for us, where we were, we were limited in terms of the amount of hours that we could be open, as well as the amount of food that we could store and recover and provide to um, our customers. So the new facility allows us to be open more hours, allows us to have much more space to store more food, and, uh, and especially most critically, um, fresh produce and proteins, which is a, a greater portion of what we provide our families today. I believe you, we have some photos of the new inside the facility. So take us inside there. What are we looking at? What's it look like? Can sure. Um, well, it's bright, bright, open, wide space. You can navigate uh, easily. Um, it's important that you everyone can see and what's available. Um, it's it's basically like a grocery store um, for our customers. It looks fantastic. Yeah, it's yeah. pretty exciting about that. I mean, it's well lit. There are windows. Um, one of the things that's very important for us is that we treat everybody with dignity and respect. And when you're you know looking for items in the bottom of a basement of a church, it's not all that nice and an enjoyable experience. So it's a very important for um, our customers and our service that we provide that that app atmosphere that makes people feel comfortable, um, relaxed, and in a dignified fashion. And you mentioned the fresh foods. I think people who haven't been at a food shelf may not realize how it really has evolved since it first opened its doors back over 30 years ago. Yeah. Without a doubt, um, uh, we now do what's called food rescue. So we work with area grocers to collect food that has reached a marketability date, but not necessarily a consumption date. Um, and this has been a huge impact to what we provide. Um, a typical household uh, probably ends up with four or five packages of frozen meats like beef, pork, nice, lamb, yeah. that kind of thing, uh, as well as fresh fruits and vegetables is also critically important. And in the old days, I think when people would donate foods, it would be like the the processed boxes of processed foods that they don't even want anymore. Right. No, it's it's really no longer your grandfather's food shelf, if you will, um, in terms of we try to avoid that. Shelf-stable foods are a necessity, unfortunately, um, but we try to make sure that those that are available are either healthier, um, less um, salts uh, in them, or, right. or more reflective of uh, people's uh, uh, ethnicity and lifestyle. So we try to have more basic necessities that reflect you know, Hispanic tastes or Somali tastes or uh, other, other uh, ethnicities. You mentioned that it, the, the demand has grown. Can you tell us a little bit about how many people and families you serve? Sure. So last year we served over 7,600 households and over wow. about 312 tons 
uh, worth of food that we That's handed incredible. out in the last year. Yeah, it's 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 significant, and unfortunately, as I said, it's a function of a little bit of the growing population. Um, but it also, it still continues to be uh, for families that are, have uh, fixed incomes or not increasing incomes in an environment and a community that, well, costs do go up. It's a challenge. And for many, food, believe it or not, is a, a, a variable, a discretionary expense, and that's where uh, people make up the difference in their budget. So we provide that, that gap. If there's someone watching and they might go, is this something for my family? I mean, how do they go about it? Sure. I think the best way is to go visit our website is ccefs.org. Uh, they have all kinds of information about the services, our hours, what you need to take advantage of our services, uh, the kinds of things that you need mm -hmm. to bring, and, and what you would necessarily expect when you came to visit us. Well, it's been a pleasure to have you with us, and good luck with the future of the food shelf then. Thank you very much. Thanks, Greg. Well, still ahead, we turn our attention to a program that's helping teens in our communities and, and how you can help. Stay with us. Cheru has no choice. She and millions like her walk miles a day for dirty water. Together, we can end their walk by providing clean water. Because when you just add water, you change a life. Learn more at worldvision.org. Teens see drugs as the number one problem they face, and it's the parents' worst nightmare. The Youth Service Bureau is helping to prevent and reduce youth substance abuse at our local schools. Joining us now to tell us about the program is Andrew Arneson with the Youth Service Bureau. So thank you for being with us, Andrea. Thank you for having us. So first of all, what is the Youth Service Bureau? The Youth Service Bureau um, provides services throughout Washington County and surrounding areas. We have three locations in Stillwater and Woodbury and Cottage Grove, but we provide um, four basic services. We were started 42 years ago and started out focusing on diversion, um, and diversion is a program that is about giving kids a second chance, and we get kids that come to us through the school systems, through teachers, recommendations from our referrals from our um, the attorney, the Washington County um, mm -hmm. court system, um, and they come to us and instead of getting a ticket or going to jail, they can do, all, there's um, community service, there's um, gr group work we do, we do work with families, um, they come to us and they basically get a chance, a second chance, they don't get a, a, anything on their record and um, they go away hopefully um, and, and majority, majority of the time much better. So we have our diversion program, we have mental health, we do um, clinical work with families in our, in our different offices. We do school-based mental health um, and chemical health, which is kind of the focus of today, um, where we provide services right in the schools. So um, we serve District um, 622 and 6, or 833 and 834. Um, so in this, um, these areas, we're right in the schools and we provide different kinds of so services. You're betting already what the schools are offering as far as social workers or Absolutely. Yep. We are the um, only ones that provide these kinds of services, and we are right on site. Um, each we're a little bit different in each district. Um, we are um, providing early intervention, prevention care, um, kind of a clinical piece, and then a educational piece. So it looks different in e each district, but we're um, we're the only ones that do what we do. Yeah. And now you're also offering a health. Um a chemical health program as well? Yep, and that's part of our school-based work. Um, we do a little bit of mental health work with that, but it's, it's the majority of the work is chemical health. Um, and so we see students in a one-to-one um, -one setting or in group work. Um, and then we also do a lot of work with, we will go into health classes or work with um, staff um, in service training. And we also do parent support because a big part of what YSB does is kind of the wraparound services. We know it's not just a, a youth with an, something going on, but the family needs to learn new behaviors, how to support their child, how to support their child's friends, um, all wow. kinds of things. So, And it seems like in this day and age, it's, it seems like it's more relevant and more needed than ever before. This, this additional Absolutely. care and, and programs and that. We're learning that. Um, uh, YSB is, um, has been focusing on that prevention, early intervention, which means we're hoping to provide resources and services before it gets to a critical point. Um, we also can help you if it gets to a critical point, but what we like to do is that, that front side where um, how do you have healthy behaviors, um, just like you when you're young and you learn how to eat healthy food, learning how to have healthy responses to peer pressure or how to use your phone, all kinds of things that play into um, behaviors ongoing later on that might not be so positive. What kind of results are you seeing with the students? 
and in the schools themselves we um, the schools are happy to have us um, if we could we'd probably um, could multiply we, we could yeah we could certainly grow then they're yeah. certainly asking for that so that's something that we're trying to do as an organization is how can we um, provide more services in our schools um, go back to your the first part of your question was just um, how is this helping the students what kind of results are you seeing the well in our diversion um, that that's a numbers piece um, where we have 84 to 86 of our the kids that come to us do not return to the to the um, wow, juvenile justice that's system fantastic. it's yeah. fantastic um, when we give presentations and we're working with um, third and fourth graders or middle schoolers, um, the outcomes we, we do um, pre and post test and things like that, but it's prevention and early intervention is hard to measure because it's what doesn't happen. Right. Um, but we know and research supports that when you um, provide that education and you provide that information, kids do better and outcomes are, are positive. Mm -hmm. You know, and when we think of, we think more as like the older students, the high yep. school, but it seems like it's very um, effective in the middle school Absolutely. setting as well. Absolutely. District 622 is focusing our, our staff person in the middle school. And so those kids are um, getting that kind of a service and group work and things that are really appropriate for their age, um, but also to help them because that's a critical time where you you know, which which way am I going to go and what's going to happen with my life? And, and um, I'm going to protect factors um, like, any, like any good positive. They seem so young, but... but right. Well, we know that that's, that's the time. And even, even younger is important, too. Just it's information. How do I, if I'm angry? Um, we know what we do and we're happy, but how do I help myself if I'm angry? So it's just all those kinds of things. The earlier we learn them, the better off we're going to be. You have a fundraiser coming up next month, and tell us about that. We do. Um, it's actually our second uh, gala. We're excited about it, and what it's done for us is it's a great way for us to raise awareness. And this year, we're focusing on our chemical health work in the schools. So we have um, Dr. Joseph Lee from Hazelton is going to be our keynote speaker. We have one of our uh, youth speaker who is a great success story for us, and he is just fantastic. Um, we have some great food from Lake Elmo Inn. Mm, and always good food. Yeah, you can't go, go wrong. And we have music by Cattail Moon, so we're excited about that kind of a blues, bluegrass um, group. But the funds raised are going to help um, support the work we do, and you're going to learn a lot about um, what's going on in, the, in our communities. So. And it will be touching students' lives in Absolutely. a positive way. Yeah. And if someone is interested in um, supporting the Youth Service Bureau but can't attend the fundraiser, sure. how can they go about doing that then? Well, they can, um, you can go online. We have um, ysb.net is our, our website, and you can click to donate there. Um, you can um, contact us and learn more about us. I always encourage that because we do so much, um, and we are, um, money is a great thing, and donations are always welcome, but we're also really interested in how can we help you? How can we help your faith community? How can we help your school or your business? Um, parents are confused about yeah, how to do job. what they're doing, and that's part of that's the fourth piece of what we do is that parent education, community education. So that's a big piece of what we do, and we like to um, do that better and do that more. So there's all kinds of ways to get involved with us or, or get support from us. So. Final comments about the Youth Service Bureau for our viewers. Oh, we do really critical work, and it's. Um, saves lives. It's really, um, it's important work and we couldn't do it without our partners. We couldn't do it without our community partners um, and our donors and opportunities like this where we can share what we do to make a difference. So thank you. Well, thank you for being with us. I appreciate it. Thanks. I know everyone's very busy, so thank you for being with sure. us. Finally, local students from Century College are nominated for two Upper Midwest Student Awards for public service announcements. Let's take a look at one of them.
We're very excited to be joined by two of the students with us and their instructor. So we have Tyler Mathis, Hi. and then we also have Louis Pei, and we have their instructor, um, Mike Eddy. Yeah. For a second, I threw a blank there. <laughs> <laughs> Glad to have you all with us, so thank you so much. Thank so um, we were just looking at the distracted driver thing. That was something that you worked on. Mm -hmm. Tell us about how did you... How did you come about doing public service announcements and why that topic? Oh, um, well, I went to school for, at Century for uh, video production and for the big project that we end our entire education with is a PSA about um, that we work the, what do we work for? Minnesota State Patrol. Yeah, the Minnesota State, State Patrol, State, yeah. yeah. So we're actually working with real clients and making something that's not just a project, it's going to be shown like to a lot of people and it's going to mean something to some people. So. Um, when they came in, they wanted to talk, they really wanted to focus on distracted driving because they're aiming for like teenagers or young adults and a uh, big thing that they have problems with is texting and driving. So I wanted to make sure that my video was going to be very to the point exactly what they wanted. So, And, and Mike, how did it come about that you were working with the Minnesota State Patrol on this? Then? Well, it's interesting. In the fall of 2013, uh, Diane, Diana Bjorkman contacted me and she is a 911 operator for the State Patrol. And she had um, experienced uh, recently some fatalities involved around um, people wanting to help accidents, but they had uh, um, gotten out of their car and also then were part of an accident. And so she wanted somehow to get information to the public about what to do if there's an accident that you don't just leap out of your car and run across traffic. So that was one of the first inputs and we started talking and over the years we've developed several themes, you know, most recently distracted driving and of course texting uh, with, with young people being our uh, target audience. And Lewis, how did you pick the topic that you, you and what was the topic that you did your pu public service announcement on? Oh, mine was, um, well, drunk driving, but um, <clears throat> it was basically, mine was focused on the emotion, the feelings of the person who who got involved with the car accident, like after the accident, because um, I've got close ones who have been like an accident, they always talk about like the terrible feelings mm -hmm. they have afterwards, so like I want to, that's why I want to steer my production towards that. I want to show that they're, you know, fear and stuff. Great topics, great videos. I've seen them both. And then, Mike, also, how does this fit into, like, their classroom at the Century College, then, or their programs there? Yeah, one of our theories in, in sort of the teaching is to try to put the students in the position that they'll be able to learn. And sometimes you kind of need the little bit of tension of a real client you know, yeah. with real deadlines. Uh, but it's also somewhat of a safe environment too because uh, the Minnesota Highway Patrol uh, knowing that they've worked with us have expectations that it is student run but it is geared to be delivered to students and so they see that as sort of a win-win and we get an opportunity to put a little pressure on but to also uh, give the students a, a good environment to practice their craft. And what kind of goes behind, I mean, when they see this, it's what, a minute long, but a lot goes into it. What kind of, take us behind the scenes just a little briefly. What oh goes into gosh. it, Lewis? Yeah, um, Tyler. Tyler, I'm um, sorry. <coughs> Lewis, Tyler. Yeah. In total, um, we must have spent like dozens and dozens of hours on these one minute videos. They Isn't are, that incredible? Yeah, like from going in, in starting our, um, just planning it, storyboarding it, showing it to the people, seeing if they're going to okay our ideas or not. Um, and then just planning how we're going to shoot it, like the actual production, getting the equipment we need, um, editing. I made the music for mine myself, so that took even more time. Congratulations. <laughs> wow. Very and, creative. Um, just constant re-editing to make it perfect. Just, it's a lot of work to make a video. Like even just a minute long video, like people, people think no it's not going to. People have yeah. do they? Yeah, no, not at all. <laughs> And then for the um, one that you were going to, what was that like behind the scenes then too, Louis? Oh, <laughs> well, that was, all, you know, like, you know, what Tyler said, like the whole kind of same production. But mine was more focused on, like, um, well, lower budget, first of all. So, like, in this, like, all it takes place in one studio. But the challenging part is also, like, with all it takes in one tick. So it's only one tick. So it took uh, a lot of effort from the crew. Like, we had, like, um, five or six students in one tick every time. <laughs> I tried to make it with all the hands and like switch from between lightings and giving in like props and all. And 
Mike and Century College and VCT, VCT then you know you you guys provided all the, the equipment and I was just like perfect. Like Mike got us, a, got us like a, a police light just specifically for our shoot. I know. And that was like awesome. that's when just I love perfectly. that. Yeah, it made it really oh, work so well. You, <laughs> so we're going to take a quick look at the one that you just did. So here yeah, it is. For sure. Again, I absolutely love both of the public service events, but they're so effective and so powerful, and hopefully the message gets out to people as well so we can avoid some of the tragedies and things like that. And congratulations on getting nominated for student awards thank through you. the Emmy organization through the Upper Midwest, so thank you so much. What was, what's it like to be recognized? It is so nice to be recognized for something. <laughs> yeah. Like, I'm sorry if it's like kind of like vain to say, but... Um, a lot of my life, I never, I never really got recognized for anything I've done, and video is just something I've really clicked with being able to do. It's just something that comes natural, and uh, it's just, it's just a weird experience to just have someone see something and be like, that should win an award, you know, like, like just being nominated is a just an honor in itself, and it's like, it's just it cool. really is. Oh, you know, almost. just being nominated means that yours was some of the best, you know. Yeah. And that of, of, of itself is a great honor. So, and right. then when did when you got the news? What did you think? Oh no! Like I was about to say, like just like even have my name on the, like listed on the catalog or like you know the handbook. Like that was just like bizarre for me. Just like Emmy Awards and then my name, Lewis. Like oh, I'm gonna <laughs> send it to my mom. <laughs> it was just a great feeling. And you know when you can do a, a a video production on no budget or low budget or no budget that you can do great things when you have a lot of money then right. yep. yeah it's all about the idea and you've got to be proud of these guys I and really all do. your students right i mean it's student productions but it's the whole five state area you know i mean there's uh, dozens of schools that submit a lot of four-year schools that we're competing with and um we don't there's what's nice is there are a lot of categories so there's news and general news and sports and we don't have very many of those types of productions but we do very well you know doing the PSAs and uh, fiction films nonfiction documentaries some different well, uh, congratulations pieces like that it really is superior that's really really good stuff that you pr have produced so thank you so and we'd like to thank you for joining us we hope you can join us next time on inside healthcare we'll see you then everyone